Welcome to Enjoying Everyday Life with New York Times bestselling author Joyce Meyer. On today's program, Joyce will be teaching from her series, Unleashing the Power of Faith. Do you feel like your faith is strong or weak? Each day we actually use faith for things like flying in an airplane or sending our children off to school or even just sitting in a chair. We have faith these outcomes will be positive. Romans chapter 12 says that each of us is given a measure of faith. Even when we don't feel like our faith is big, we can have hope in God's word that as a believer, we have a level of faith. We simply need to use it. The more we release our faith, the more we are able to give our circumstances over to God and trust that he's in control of everything. Now, here's Joyce with today's series, Unleashing the Power of Faith. Open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 11. John 11, I'm sorry, not Luke. But some of them said, could not he who opened a blind man's eyes have prevented this man from dying? The man they're talking about was Lazarus, who actually happened to be a good friend of Jesus's. Jesus frequently went to Mary and Martha and Lazarus's house. They were brother and sister and ate with them. And they'd seen Jesus do many other miracles, but he let his good friend Lazarus die. Now Jesus again, sighing repeatedly <laughs> and being deeply disquieted. Let's just stop there for a minute. Why was Jesus sighing and being deeply disturbed in his spirit at what they were saying? Because he wanted to see faith. He didn't want to hear how they couldn't understand why he hadn't done anything. He wanted them to believe that no matter how bad the situation was, that he could still do something. Somebody in here needs to hear that tonight. That no matter how bad the situation is, God just wants you to believe because he can very well still do something. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But we started last night talking about how faith must be released. To have it is one thing, to use it is another. To have it is one thing, to use it is another. If you have a muscle you don't use, it begins to get weak and it shrivels. If you don't use your faith for all intent and purposes, it's going to be to you no different than if you didn't have it. Unto every man is given the measure of faith. We all have faith. Every time you sit in a chair, it takes faith. You believe it won't cave in. We've actually got one in our hotel room right now that you feel like you're going to fall through when you sit in it. So I learned real quick not to have faith in that chair. But <laughs> by and large, when you sit in a chair, I mean, you just... You don't go, oh, my gosh. Oh, I wonder. I'm afraid to sit in this chair. Should I sit in the chair? I don't know if I should sit in the chair. I'm worried about the chair. Now I'm getting anxiety over the chair. I'm being double-minded about the chair. Should I sit in this chair? Should I sit in that chair? You just go plop down in the chair. And I just wish when we have a problem that we could just plop into Jesus' arms like that and say, I'm asking you to take care of it, and I believe that you will. I'm releasing my faith through my prayers and I'm going to line my mouth up with your promises and I'm going to do whatever you ask me to do and you will do the rest. I want to tell you something tonight and I don't want you to ever forget this. If you do what you can do, God will do what you cannot do. You heard the woman, maybe if you were here last night, gave a testimony early in the meeting about how she was just as desperate as desperate could be. Her husband had been discovered that he had a terrible addiction to pornography and she'd been in ministry and he left her and she was five days before she was going to have a baby and she didn't have income and she came to one of my conferences, scraped up everything together she could and God told her to become a partner with us and she thought, you have got to be kidding. And she started it, I think she said it was like $5 a month and that was a stretch, that was her diaper money. But she just kept it up and kept believing God and kept believing God. Why was it important for her to give in her desperation? Because that's one of the ways that we release our faith. Releasing your faith requires some kind of action. When you pray, you need to release your faith. When you give, you need to release your faith with your gift. And you need to make sure that you're lining what you say up with what you've prayed. Doesn't do one bit of good to say, oh God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would deliver my husband from drinking and you would save him, Lord, and you would change him and that our marriage would be healed. Amen, 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 amen. 
and then go out to lunch with Sister Brown the next day and say, I'm telling you what, that man is never going to change. <laughs> I mean, I'm so sick and tired of the way he acts, drunk all the time. He won't ever get saved. There's no hope. Go back and get religious. Oh, God, my God, I ask you to save this man. And don't tell me we don't do that because we do. We, just, we still just get a whole bunch of this religious stuff. Sometimes I think we try to say things to God just to hear ourselves sound spiritual. Maybe you need to say less and mean every word that you say <laughs> and make sure that you're releasing your faith and understanding what that means. That if you're going to pray in faith, you got to stay in faith. Amen? Come on. If you're going to pray in faith, you got to stay in faith. you got to hold on to your faith when it looks tough. So here Lazarus had died and they're bothered about the situation that he died because they sent a message that he was sick and, and Jesus waited two more days before he went. So he waited to let him die. Well, if you would have been here. And he's like, oh, you just don't get it. Now Jesus, sighing repeatedly and deeply disquieted, approached the tomb and it was a cave, a hole in the rock, and a boulder lay across the entrance to close it. And Jesus said, take away the stone, take away the stone. Let me just ask you a question. If he's getting ready to raise the guy from the dead, which is an outrageous miracle because you'll see in a minute, Martha's like, well, what's the point in that? He's been dead four days. I mean, this is going to really put off an odor. <laughs> and these were people just like us. But if Jesus is going to raise the guy from the dead, which he already knew full well he was going to do, why in the world didn't he just blow the stone out of the way? Why did he tell them to move the stone? See, some of you are not getting your miracle because you're not moving your stone. Even like what I shared earlier, you want a miracle, but maybe you're not willing to forgive the people that have hurt you. Maybe you're mad at 10 people and not understanding why God's not moving in your life. Hmm. Well, maybe not. Maybe not you guys. I don't know. <laughs> some people somewhere, maybe some of these people watching by TV, maybe could have that problem. I don't know. Amen? I mean, how many more Bible studies do we have to hear? on forgiveness. Will another 50 do it? Another 25? It finally comes down to do it. <laughs> There's a wonderful place in the Bible where Mary wanted Jesus to do a miracle. She was actually like a really kind of a everyday practical thing. They were at a wedding and ran out of wine and Jesus' mother wanted him to whip up some more. And she turned to the servants there and said, whatever he says to you, do it. I love those few words. And can I say to you, whatever he says to you, do it. Well, they got their miracle, but they wouldn't have if they wouldn't have done what he said. And you'll get your miracle too if you'll do what he says, but if you're not going to do what he says, then you're not doing what you can do because he'll never give you something to do that you cannot do. It may be something you don't want to do. It may be something you won't like to do. It may be something that might be a little bit of a struggle for you to do, but God will never, ever give you anything to do that you cannot do. So stop telling him you can't do it and just do it. That was really helpful to me when I figured that out because we waste years. Oh, God, I can't. I can't. God, it's too hard. I know you want me to, but I can't. Yes, you can. And that's just a web of deception that Satan spins. But when you know the character of God, you know that he is not going to give one of his children something to do that they cannot do. Amen? The releasing of our faith 
I believe, comes through praying, through saying, through keeping your confession in line with what you're believing for, not praying for one thing, talking the opposite. How many of you agree with that? That doesn't make any sense. And then through making a conscious decision that whatever God asks you to do, you're going to do it. You're not going to get in works of the flesh trying to make a bunch of stuff happen. You don't need to be doing a bunch of stuff that God didn't tell you to do. But if he's told you in here to do it or you've got to ram a word from him to do it, then that's part of your faith walk is just very simply doing what God told you to do. And I might add, don't even be worrying about the results. A lot of times like, well, I did that and nothing's changed. Well, it will. It will. Maybe there's a couple of other things he's going to tell you to do before you get your final breakthrough. We talk about walking in faith and it's a walk. It's a step and a step and a step and a step. And the number of times I've had to pray and say and do and pray and say and do and pray and say and do to get from where I was to where I am. But it kind of gets to be fun after a while. Because you just learn the faithfulness of God. And that if you do the little bit you can do, he'll always come through and do the part that you cannot do. I want, I'm going to say that so many times tonight, you're never going to forget it. If you do what you can do, God will do what you cannot do. Amen? I hope you're not one of the people that's done so little for so long that you can't even say, Amen. <laughs> can I tell you something? Christianity is not a passive religion. It's not something where we're just going to sit around and want stuff and God's going to show up with it to keep us happy. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, exclaimed, well, Lord, by this time, he's decaying and is throwing off an offensive odor. <laughs> well, Lord, my problem stinks. <laughs> For he's been dead four days. And Jesus said, did I not tell you and promise you that if you would believe that you would see the glory of God? I love that. Just believe and you will see the glory of God. And I might add that when you do really believe, when I really believe, then we enter the rest of God. And so the weight is not even a problem because we're enjoying ourselves while we're waiting on God to move. You do not have to be upset until God solves your problem. I said you do not have to be upset until God solves your problem. You do not have to be miserable until God solves your problem. And I don't want to be negative and give you a downer, but even when he solves this one, you're probably going to get another one so if you don't ever learn to be happy while you got the problems, you're not going to be very happy in your life. You say, well, I don't want to hear that stuff. Well, wouldn't you rather me tell you the truth and give you some pie in the sky floaty where you go, oh, praise the Lord, then go home and wonder why in the world it's not working? We're never promised a problem-free life. We don't have faith, so we can never have a problem. We have faith so we can have a problem, but it not have us. We don't need to be so wrapped up in our problems. You know, worry is making a down payment on a problem you're probably never going to have. So let's just learn some stuff about worry. You know, we need to get to the point where we can have a little chaos in our life and it not bother us. Did you hear what I said? We need to get to the point where we can have a few things that aren't working the way we'd like it to and it just not bother us. When you believe God, you will see the glory of God. That doesn't mean you won't have to wait for a while, but Hebrews 4 says those who have believed do enter the rest of God. And above all that you do, you should strive diligently to enter the rest of God. The rest of God is such a wonderful place because you're seated in heavenly places spiritually with Christ waiting for him to make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Thanks for listening. Learn how to unleash your faith by ordering today's offer, Build Faith Package, which includes a three CD series and Building Faith booklet or purchase everything as a digital download. This package is available now for a donation of $15 or more in U.S. funds, and we do accept all major credit cards. You can order today's offer from our website at JoyceMeyer.org, or you can call us toll-free at 1-800-789-0089. Again, the number is 1-800-789-0089. The Bible, our instruction book for life. Spending time in God's Word will change our lives, but consistent and effective study can at times be challenging. That's one reason why Joyce is here to help. 
At JoyceMeyer.org slash Bible study, you'll find ways to make your study time come to life with helpful resources, study suggestions, and encouragement from Joyce. Get the most you can out of your time studying God's Word with everyday study. Sign up today at JoyceMeyer.org slash Bible study. Thanks again for listening to Enjoying Everyday Life. Our mission here at Joyce Meyer Ministries is simple, sharing Christ and loving people. Remember, together we can do more.